when George, hello, when George stood up there, walked up there with that big black bag, I, I couldn't decide if he had the Gutenberg Bible in that or his lunch. I mean, that thing, <laughs> or he's running away from home. I'm not sure what. Is there just a Bible in there? Oh, okay. And a tuna fish sandwich. <laughs> yeah, Brian said, is it you preaching? And we try to keep it a secret till the last minute because Monica found out that I was preaching and she said, oh, no. <laughs> I threatened to duct tape her to this chair. She said she had a box cutter, so I don't want to. <laughs> I don't know why she carries a box cutter. Huh? <laughs> um, it's been, it seems, it's been a couple months ago, actually, that, that I, start, I talked to you about Jacob wrestling the angel, and we had some points there that we were talking about the three different ways, things that you, you, how to, you gotta meet God alone, you must expect or ask God for a blessing, and then the last point was you must meet him at a point of weakness. And when I was making that point, I, I introduced the subject, I started talking about the term transformation. The idea that uh, transformation is something that is expected of us and it's something that we need to be concerned about and things we need to be doing. And uh, we didn't get into it and um, I even got a, a message from Delbert and he was like, hey, I, I'm not sure I understand that term and I don't think a lot of us understand totally what that means when we talk about transformation and the importance of it. Conversion is the point where you hear the gospel you hear the truth, you believe it, you act on it, you're baptized, you repent of your sins, you, you, what you know that you have, and you are baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you're born again. That's the point where you go from darkness into light. And in reality, that's kind of like a, that's a legal transaction. That's when, at some point, we were lost, we can't pay the debt, we don't know how to do it, we can't cover our sin, God said, I'll send my son, we'll pay the debt, paid in full. That's the conversion process. When you were baptized into Christ, you were converted from a lost, dark world to the light. We all understand that. But that's the easy part. So much of that is done for us. So much of that is, we just have to accept it, we have to believe it, we just have to surrender and say, okay, I want that. But transformation is a whole lot more work on our part. When the Bible says work out your salvation, your own salvation with fear and trembling, I think it's referring to a lot of the transformation process. When, when you say, what, what's the purpose of a transformer? It if you're- a large amount of lectures to, to a lesser amount so you can use. Okay, it takes a, a big bunch of power comes from the power company, and if that went straight into your home, it burned down in about 30 seconds. Right. But it transforms it to be used. God's power is extremely powerful. If God used his power on us and zapped us with all of his power at once to change us, we'd be crispy critters. We, we, would not, we could not stand that. He, he gives us the process, he allows that process to take place in increments, in processes, in, in a, a, thank goodness, in a slow way sometimes. And, and the truth is, when you were converted, you made some very serious, quick changes. It was obvious your life changed. And that's good. If you didn't change anything about your behavior, about your heart, about your life, about the things you uh, say and do and where you go, at the point of your conversion, you probably weren't truly converted. Because everybody, we, there has to be a whole lot of adjustments. Remember, repentance is that idea of just making a U-turn and going the opposite direction. But transformation, see, and, and what happens a lot of times is we get baptized into Christ, we feel that change, but then we get stymied. We think, okay, I made the change, and now we could be a Christian for years and not see real big change differences from that original point of being converted. Is that making sense? And so Colossians 3.2 or 3.10 says, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of the creator. Now, who's he speaking to there? 
Christians. All people had already been born again. They'd been converted. But now he's saying this is an active uh, uh, a tense. He's saying now start doing this. Be, be renewed. Put on your new self in the knowledge, in the, name, in the image of the Creator. How do you know what the Creator looks like? What Jesus say? If you seen the Father, you seen me. If me, you seen the Father. Both ways. It worked both ways. So Jesus is our example. He's our model. He's not. We'll never live up to his standard. But he gives us something to shoot for. He gives us something to to look at, and and it's a perfect example. And so he's saying our job is to go to work and start being renewed. Clean up your act a little by little. Philippians 2.12 says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. All right, wait a minute. Continue to work out. Okay, who's, whose responsibility is to work on your salvation? Me. You. You. But, who helps you do that? How do you do that? You do it by self well, by willpower, by reading a good book, by, what's he say? God's word. It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now, I like the amplified version of that very passage. And if you ever, re ever use the amplified version, it, it just puts in parentheses things that it explains different words uh, in, in more detail. And he says it like this. Continue to work out your salvation. That is, cultivate it, bring it to full effect, actively pursue spiritual maturity with all inspired fear and trembling, using serious caution and critical, listen to this, critical self-evaluation to offend anything that might offend God or discredit the name of Christ. For it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for His good pleasure. Wow, that's good. It's, it's explaining. It's a, it's a team effort, effort. And we have to do this with fear and trembling. Why, why does he say that? What's that mean when you go about something with fear and trembling? That means shaking your boots? Or what's he mean? Take it seriously. Take it this is not something you just flip, no, oh, I'll, I'll do it, maybe. Yeah, it'll be good. No, he's saying, this is important. You need to be concerned that you're, that you're focusing on this. And transformation, being renewed, is happening. And it's your responsibility, not someone else's. Only you can decide that you want to do that, and you want to make that happen with the help of God and, and with others. So what is transfer, transformation? It's a life long process. It's a schooling process that's never finished until we are physically with the Lord. We are in a constant training school of life. We never have arrived at anything. We can't say, well, that's one thing I will never struggle with. That's a sure way of inviting the devil to come at you. You know, we've learned that. We've said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll never, I'd never live in Chicago. That didn't work out too well for us. There we were. Or I'll never live here. I'll never do that. Or I'll and then God says, well, I'll show you. <laughs> so I'll ne so I've, I've figured that out. Well, I'll never live in Hawaii. Let's see if that happens. <laughs> Still waiting. <laughs> it's a maturing process. Growing up in the Lord. And you can say, well, I'm, I'm a 40-year-old. I've been, in the, I've been in Christ 40 years. But do you have 40 years of transformation or do you just live the same year over and over like Groundhog Day? Same thing. You know. And so it's making something that was badly damaged by sin. That's our life. Not just your sin, but other sin too. You've been damaged by other people's sin. You've been damaged by your own you, because we live in a sin-cursed world. And what we do is we look at that and we begin to restore us, or the importance is God begins to restore us back to the intended way he, he wants us to be. 
the way he wants us to live. And we work on that until we are totally perfected in death. And that's when it happens. But he expects us to continue to grow, to continue to change. You've got to look at your own life and just ask yourself, are you, are you where you want to be? And if, if you say, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much where I want to be spiritually, uh, well, there's something wrong with you. Because you don't understand how much damage we've had in our hearts and how much, how much, I mean, I guess it's, we, we just don't know how bad we have been hurt by sin. And we've formed habits and lives and beliefs and things. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. And I want to say this, transformation is not just simply discipleship. So discipleship is very important. We need each other. We need, as Marty said, a caddy from time to time to help us, to show us, to tell us things. And I've, I've golfed with caddies on a golf course that if they hadn't been there, I would have done the exact opposite. And they'll say, uh, you want to hit that ball way right over there. And I'm like, well, it, it, the hole's over there. And they say, I know, but hit it over there. And sometimes people would go, ah, he's crazy, and they'd hit it over there, and it would be in the swamp or the water, and if you do what he says. So discipleship is, is necessary. We need help. Any, no man's an island. If you think you can do it all by yourself, you are sorely mistaken. But so much of discipleship is behavior modification. It's they act different. You know, here's how a Christian is supposed to act. Change this, do this, act like this. Come to church, be here, read your Bible. All those things that are good actions that we should be doing, nothing wrong with them, but you can do all those things and never have a transformed heart. You can do that to conform. You can do it to get the caddy off your back and look good, but that doesn't mean your heart's been transformed. And so transformation is a much deeper, uh, deeper situation than discipleship and, and just behavior modification. It's doing something when you're transformed, when you're really working on your transformation, you're doing it out of a, a debt of gratitude for God, a love for God. When you just are trying to be a disciple, often you just do your duty. And duty, or no husband or no wife wants to think, well, they stay with me out of duty. They live with me because it's their duty to do it. No, you want to be loved. You want to have a relationship where people do, each, uh, do things to each other, for each other, uh, and live with each other so that because they, because you love them or they love you. And that's what God expects and wants from us. And so 1 Peter, we talk about that in, ch in chapter 1 where it says uh, that we do those things. We, uh, we want to... Um, be transformed, because if you add to your faith goodness and knowledge and all those things, he says it talks about being able to participate in the divine nature. How do we do that? How do we participate in the divine nature? Be like God. Be like the Lord. How is that possible? Let me, let me use this illustration. Marty, you're driving along sometime. You've been in a lot of different places, industrial places and stuff. And uh, you're, you're going along and you're taking a walk and you come upon a big toxic waste dump. You know, there's signs, and, but your curiosity gets the best of you. Next thing you know, you've fallen into that toxic waste dump. Can't get out. Nobody around. You're trying to climb out. You, I mean, that stuff is just, it's just seeping in. I mean, it's just full of radioactive stuff and poison and all that stuff and insecticides and pesticides and yeah, you know, are your skin crawling yet? Yeah, there may be leeches and bee bugs and all kinds of stuff down in there. But somebody comes along, Ed comes along and says, Marty, what are you doing down there? Oh, I'm, I can't get out. And he throws you a line. He pulls you out. He gets you out of there. He may hose you off. He ain't gonna let him, he's not going to let you in his car. Um, but he gets your feet on solid ground. Hallelujah. Now, what's that describe? That's it. You were in a toxic waste dump called the world. And it's full of poison. And you were hosed off. <laughs> you were baptized into Christ. And yet, you come up out of there. In God's eyes, you are pure as the driven snow. You are, you, your sins, the toxic waste has been washed away to some degree or another. When you look at 
when you're baptized into Christ, you are pure. You are saved. You are, legal, in a legal way, right with God. But anybody that has been in a toxic waste dump and they've been hosed off a little bit, and yet you still got side effects. You know, you may grow a third ear. I mean, it's hard to tell what will happen. You've got all kinds of problems. You develop health issues. And I think, I, I think this is probably one of our biggest mistakes and flaws that we made over the years. We were so willing and wanted, and it's a needed thing, to go out to highways and byways and baptize people and get them uh, from darkness into light. But we forgot that they came out of a toxic waste dump. And we expected them to change and to be able to live the life that God wants them to live with not a lot of help. And I think that when we understand that, this is, this is the point where if I was starting all over, if I was starting a ministry all over, I'd, I'd focus on this more than anything else, that we still need to reach out, we need to baptize as many people as we can, but we need to understand just how damaged each of us really are. How much trouble, how hard it is to get that effect of the world off of us. And you cannot do it overnight. You can't do it by yourself. You can't do it without God and without a willingness on your part to be open and, and, and honest about how much damage you really have. And oftentimes you don't even know how damaged you are. Because you've lived in this world for so long, it's just normal. And I think we frustrated people and we expect people, we put too much on people to think, well, they just, they changed. And then we're disappointed when we wonder why they left or why they quit or why they don't show up or why you have to hound people to come to church on Sunday to go after them. And con because they're still, they're still got the toxic effects of the dump on them. Are, are they saved? Yeah. To a point that at some point they can decide to walk away and jump back in the pit. Mm -hmm. And often people do. But I think that I don't, want to, I don't want to leave the wrong impression. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. He has left the crimson stain that makes me white as snow. That's still the truth. That's still a fact. But we still have a responsibility to grow. The Bible talks about when you're appointing elders, it says don't appoint a novice because they don't know what they're doing yet. They gotta grow into it. And often we put things on people before they're ready. We expect things out of people before they're ready. And we need to do our best to figure out what it takes to help people add to their faith goodness and knowledge and self-control and perseverance, godliness and kindness. Why? Because it says in verse 8, if you do that in increasing measure, it will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think it needs to be spelled out straight up when a person becomes a Christian right up, right up front, you're gonna be expected to grow. You're gonna be expected to change and mature and don't expect it to happen overnight. You know, um, I, I love golf and it's not for everybody and it's the most frustrating thing that you can do. I mean, anybody, Brian, anybody that shot par and quit is just, they're just a loser. Um, <laughs> I mean, it just blows your mind, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I might quit if I shot par. I'd just hang it up and say, yeah, I, 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 I shoot par. And that'd be the end of it. But um, my grandson, two grandsons, would go along with us sometimes. We'd play, and, and you know, they just ride along in the cart and want to drive and run over things. But um, <laughs> they would get out and hit the ball. And, you know, it's ter they're terrible. And Hudson said the other day, he said, I, I want to play golf this spring. But he said, I'm horrible at it. And I said, Hudson, everybody is horrible at it. At this stage, you may be good, you just don't know it. But anybody that starts is horrible at it. And you know the truth is, I, 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 you, any of you that have just been recently converted, you're horrible at it. 
And don't think, well, I just can't do this because I'm horrible at it. So is everybody else. Now, we may have learned along the way, the older we get, there are certain things that we think, well, I ain't going to do that anymore because that doesn't pay. You know, you touch the burning uh, a hot stove a, a time or two, you figure out that you don't do that anymore. But being, as a new Christian, there's so many things that we're just not going to be good at, but all he says is add to these qualities in increasing measure, little by little in every way, little by little in every day. That's, that's how we got to live and, and not get too discouraged about that. And so, so salvation is free. It's not earned, but growth is expected. Not as payment on the debt, but because God wants us to be happy and useful and free from the harmful effects of the toxic waste dump. But we still have to address how to make this happen. What does it take to move forward in the process? Well, let's spend a little bit of time in, in talking about that. Uh, what's the number one most important thing in our transformation process? Jesus said, you shall know the truth. truth, and the truth shall set you free. Without the truth, there is no chance of transformation. You have to know the truth. There's no, you can't rid yourself of the toxic waste, side effects, without the truth. And, but here's the thing, the truth that we have to accept the beginning of transformation. You are far more damaged than you believe. You are far more locked in to certain kinds of thinking that's not the truth than you know. You think you know, but you don't know what you don't even know. And that's really confusing. I'm confused and I just said it. In religious circles, when you hear the word truth, in church setting, oh, they obeyed the truth. Or you hear the word truth. What normally is the connotation of that? What's people thinking about when you say the truth? The scripture says thy word is truth. Thy word is truth, okay. What you need to do to become a Christian. What you need to do to be a, become a Christian. They obeyed the truth. And uh, the herald of truth, the word of truth. Uh, you know, these are things that a lot of churches, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. We, doctrine is important. We understand that. But when we talk about truth in most circles, in a lot of churches, all they're talking about is uh, doctrine. What you must do. What's acceptable. What's not acceptable. Uh, what we should do, shouldn't do. Uh, can we do this? Can we do that? Uh, how many songs can we have? How can we sing? What songs can we sing? What should be happening in a service? Uh, are we allowed to do this? Are we allowed to do that? Is that authorized? And here's the problem with all that. I don't have any problem with us wanting to do the things right. But so much of that is man-made. So much of it is nothing based on scripture. It is based on people's opinions and years and years and years of tradition. And the problem with the reason why it's dangerous is this. When you're focusing on those issues, that becomes your truth. And you've got so many things in your life, in your heart, that really need to be focused on. And Jesus said what they were doing is they would, he talked about the Pharisees, they'd strain in a gnat and swallow a camel. Yeah. And so when, when we are focusing on how to do things, procedures, all these kind of things, we're not focusing on the real truth. That's not the maturing process. That does not transform us in any way. Matter of fact, it's a roadblock to our transformation. And so when people start, well, I think we need to do this. I think we need to do this. I say, you know, okay, I understand that. I appreciate that. But are you working on your own heart? Are you looking at yourself? Are you really seeing the truth about who you are and focusing on the most important thing? What's the opposite of truth? A lie. A lie. And I want you to, if you're writing anything down, you don't have to. But I'd like for you to write this down. A lie is the root or the catalyst for all sin. I'm going to say it again. A lie is the root or the catalyst for all sin. Let me explain. Adam and Eve in the garden, walking along, been there who knows how long. Loved God, trusted God, being blessed. Had no reason to disobey him, never even thought of it. Trusted him. Along comes Satan, 
And what does he, how does he approach with a lie? It starts with a lie and a half truth. Did God say, you know, well, he's trying to do this. He's trying to keep you. And he, he planted a lie, not the truth. What was the truth? The truth was God loved them. He cared for them. He served them. They had everything perfect. They hadn't even thought about sin. They didn't know what sin was. But as soon as we bite on the lie, sin becomes very, very obvious, easy to fall for. And when you look at that, that, that is their, when their belief in the Father was destroyed or damaged by a lie, it was easy for them to walk away, to do what they did, to not trust the Father anymore. And here's the truth. We live in a culture of deceit. Everywhere you look is lies. You can't believe anything you hear anymore. I mean, I mean Pete's a, he's a great guy, but I don't trust half the things he says. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not true. But this world is so full of deceit and it's permeated with lies. Politics, oh, come on. That press secretary comes on TV, she ought to have a name tag that says, uh, Sec, uh, was a press secretary, personal liar, professional liar. Her job is to take the bad stuff and turn it and lie about it, and you know she's lying because her mouth is moving. And I'm not saying that's nothing about Republican, Democrat, it's just in politics in general. Advertisements are just full of lies. If you buy this car, I mean, you're gonna, you, you know, everything's gonna be perfect. And uh, take this drug, and boy, you're going to be able to fly to the moon. I mean, do all these things. Uh, all this stuff, every commercial is full of something that's full of deceit. Everywhere you look, you're being told lies. Education, our kids are being lied to every day in their schools. Amen. And so the truth is we have a very hard time believing the truth because we're flooded so much with lies. And we don't know the difference sometimes. If you hear something often enough and over and over again and everybody's saying it, eventually, maybe at first you didn't believe it, but now you do. And you just begin to live with that lie. Transformation requires us believing the truth. And the reason we don't have or we haven't matured in Christ is that we believe the lies more than we believe the truth. <clears throat> you think that's true? Yeah. You see, if you're just listening to a sermon or a class or anything would really change our character and cause us to be transformed, we would be spiritual giants right now. It takes more. See, for every principle, every action, there is a reaction, an opposite reaction. God comes along and he tells us the truth. You hear the truth. I may, I may preach to you the truth about something. Mike teaches you the truth. But for every action, there is a Negative or opposite reaction. So, what's Satan's job? Plant. No. Doubt it. There's a reason why. That, I don't know if I buy that. I'm not sure. You know, God loves you no matter what. Well, Satan says, how could he love you the way you are? How, how could you do that? How could you believe that God could love you? Or, if he loved you so much, why did he let this happen? Why did he let that person die in your life? Or why did he let you get cancer? If he loves... You see, you know, the, when they shoot off these... Over in the Middle East, when they were lobbing um, rockets over into Israel or Syria, wherever, they had those scud rockets yeah. that as soon as they'd shoot up, they'd come up and blow it out of the sky. And for every truth that you hear... Satan has ready and able, and he's got a rocket, a bomb, trying to shoot it out of your heart, out of your mind, over and over again. So it is a constant battle of what you believe. We say, well, he's an unbeliever. No, there is no such thing as an unbeliever. We all believe in something. But when we sin, we're believing in the lie. And we'll get into some uh, examples of that. In, 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 at some point here, but not today because we're out of time. But Satan has an arsenal full of weapons that he's stockpiled with your name written on it. God sends out a message of truth that he loves you, that he adores you, and, you, and Satan says, it's a lie. He doesn't love you. Look what's happened. 
Look at reality. Or, I think you get the point. Fact is, we have believed and believed right now so many lies about God and ourselves, we can't trust our own heart. It has been conditioned and diseased by our sin and even the sins of others. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Every sin we commit is based on a lie. Sin is an act of faith based on a lie. You do something that you say, I just had to do this, that's a lie. It was based on a lie. Well, they made me mad and I said this and you didn't have to say that. It was based on a lie. I need, we can get into to more details in a little bit, not today. But transformation only happens when we're able to recognize the lie in any given situation. And that has to start with a hunger and thirst for the truth, the truth about ourselves. I mean, you think you know you, but remember the heart is most deceitful. The truth is very painful. It exposes a raw nerve in us that makes us recoil from that truth. The truth always has at its goal or aim to transform our character and our relationship with God and, and relationship with others, but it's painful because we have to see ourselves for who we really are and admit we are weaker than we thought we were and we need help more than we uh, thought we needed it and we don't know as much as we thought we knew. And when we get to that point of hunger and thirsting and fear and trembling, I want to grow, Lord, and you start talking to God about these things, it's amazing how the transformation takes place. And over the next few weeks, when I'm speaking to you, I, I, want, I would like to get into some of the practical things that God uses to speak to us the truth and how we can combat the lies, how we can deal with the truth. Notice that God only operates in the realm of truth and Satan only operates in the world of lie. If nothing else this week, your prayer should be, God, just help me see the lies. Amen. Not, not politics, not that stuff. No, just about yourself. For everything that you're struggling with, everything you're dealing with, every emotion that, that comes to mind, God, I know there's a truth and there's a lie. Help me know and see the truth versus the lie. And we do that, we start to move on. I think that we'll begin to understand what true transformation is, and we'll be glad that we did. Mike's going to come up and share with you a couple